Okay, welcome back. It's uh, 426 of 2015. We're going to look at lesson number four by Paul Ricoeur on the concept of selfhood. And we're going to look at the preparatory work of the perlocutionary step, which was the third moment in the last lesson. We have to solve the problem of the aporia of anchoring. Ricoeur says we've got to anchor our posited sign that we're trying to work on. It has to be anchored to some kind of a trajectory. It has to be anchored to some kind of a thread of intentionality. So what what are we going to anchor that to? And Ricoeur says that, uh, well, we're going to try to find a kafali, which is the Greek concept for alignment or orientation. We want to find and assign a kafali orientation for our positive sign. And uh, in other words, we want our sign utterance of extension to gain a cornerstone of alignment. And these statements of extension, we mentioned before, they do include the reference sign, the directional sense of the reference sign, the phonetic stance of conviction concerning the subject doing the positing and the dialogue. And all of that together creates a uh, anchored orientation. So we do posit that convergence of referent and extension. And we do uh, recognize that by adding to that uh, the metaphor of orientation or phronetic stance that we can come up with uh, a true fixation of anchoring. And that fixation of anchoring actually becomes associated with the posited self also, the subject, not just a anchored statement, but it's anchored statement and anchored subject in perfect alignment with each other. So we've got a, a true uh, setting in place of the cornerstone for our dialogue threshold. Now, Ricoeur says that uh, the 10-step process of solving the aporia of anchoring has to be inscribed in the uh, signification that we are positing. So the two steps of preparation in this first moment are going to be anchoring and inscription. So when we talk about inscription, we must inscribe the signification before we can actually jump into praxis positing of specific content in history. So the dialogical inscribing of the orientation is empowered by the elocutionary force of, of speech act that we discussed last lesson and that uh, motivational base of attestation that we discussed in the very first lesson and that helps us to uh, posit an orientation along with the posited sign in our dialogue. Because that motivational base is always open to us, remember it, it bleeds into every moment. It doesn't matter what moment is being discussed, the motivational base of attestation bleeds into every other moment and affects every other moment. And it certainly will affect a orientation of a, the trajectory of our positive sign. I mean, that's obviously going to be a huge influence, the motivational base of attestation. So the inscription is posited as an accompanying name of one's frenetic stance. In other words, we present it in some kind of a language to accompany the sign we're positing. And uh, it becomes a designated kafali cornerstone of alignment for the signification we, pr we propose. Ricoeur says there are three parts that make up this uh, enjoined orientation. And uh, they include the sign's name, the uh, recognition that we're involved in a living present of, an, of a type organism of dialogue, and that uh, we are adding the inscribed orienting anchor and trajectory to our posited sign. And that results in a referent and agent becoming aligned with each other in existential meaning. There becomes a true alignment between self and the sign that is positive. So sign and self become aligned as a, an orient, orientation or trajectory of the uh, intentionality for the sign. So the cornerstone gets put in place. We do the prep work of anchoring and we do the prep work of a linguistic uh, inscription and that allows us to move on to uh, 
what Ricoeur calls the schema of action theoretical side of praxis positing. Before he can discuss praxis, which we're not even going to get into it in this lesson because he just wanted to work on the prep work. But we will look at the theoretical schema. And there are uh, nine aspects to this step. So we look at this uh, number one sign model, anchoring and inscription as they form or structure to what we're positing, allow us to progressively construct a network of related intersignification or a sign model. Now we take the uh, lexical content of the signs we've been positing and couple that with the uh, anchoring trajectory of a syntactical structuring. And if you put the, the lex lexicon and the structure together, the lexicon and the syntax together, you can create a model or a sign model. So now the self can transition from the theoretical ideal sign model to the practical realm of praxis positing a very specific intent in history. It becomes a moment of a psychological axis flip from the theoretical to the practical. The axis flip from the theoretical to the practical. When we get into the realm of the practical, we are interrogated existentially. The specific um, posited statement is going to be critiqued, critiqued by the sign model and by the motivational base of attestation, which always bleeds into every moment. And the uh, generic concept of selfhood that interrogates us existentially and keeps us uh, on target for the um, existential answer to the uh, selfhood. Recourse says there is a preconditional um, context of reflexive nature to this entire action process. The question of who is uh, overlapped ontologically with the concept of self. And uh, there are sub-concepts that help us to understand this uh, reflexive type context. They are labor and work. Labor is externalized as the thing produced. Work changes culture through reflexive embodiment. So it can become document, it can become monument, it beca and can become institution. In the case of a hermeneutic of selfhood, the reflexive embodiment that results from our positing actually is the, uh, the narrative that gets constructed, the narrative of selfhood, the narrative of humanity. So an emerging triad begins to surface and the pivotal questions of praxis evolve that uh, every action proceeds dialectically through a series of what why questions or content and intentionality and only then do we move on to the who question but it's only after a series of uh, positings concerning content and intention the concept of the event becomes the middle term of the triad and uh, then we can actually move on to a conceptual understanding of selfhood and even move beyond um, sign model. But it's through the process of the, uh, the triad of action. And uh, he gives it to us as a what, why, and a who. What has been posited and has occurred in history? What uh, is the intentionality that has been posited? And how is that intentionality qualified? and the return out of this uh, ontological event that's taking place. And then, by examining critically this return of uh, how our positing was uh, concretized, then we can start working on the narrative of the who or the narrative of selfhood and revise it to greater and greater um, concrete expressions as authentic selfhood. But it is a progressive narrative. It's a narrative that evolves according to our the return that comes out of every positing of our praxis specific interpretation of our sign model and how we see it affecting history. But then when it does get to actualized, we see additional things surface that we didn't think of before. We get a return. And to get the return, we have to reevaluate the narrative. We have to reevaluate our motivational base of attestation. We have to uh, be willing to be open to revision, to sign model, to conviction base, to uh, 
the way that we form our practice statements. So all of it gets qualified in return, but then we can really start uh, addressing the existential who. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be uh, abbreviated under the concept of selfhood and humanity? So it gives us a great little lesson here. But it's all prep work. He did not get into uh, praxis yet. It's the preparatory work of the perlocutionary step of the last lesson. And we looked at uh, the aspect of anchoring that's essential. You have to have an orientation that uh, defines and aligns the sign that you're positing. And it has to be one that you, uh, an orientation that you include and invite the other subject in the dialogue to take up as well. Uh, because you could um, say that this uh, perlocutionary work of anchoring is an orientation that would probably fit best in that posited third subject of consciousness. Remember that universality aspect of the third virtual subject? You could probably put uh, this material of orientation, this uh, content of orientation, in that uh, co-mutual um, workspace of consciousness, universal consciousness. Because you do want to supply a sort of universality to your orientation of the sign. So you do the anchoring, and then after we anchored it, we find out that we have to inscribe it. Well, you inscribe it through language. You inscribe it because every action includes language. Language is on the same plane of action. Remember the last lesson, Rekur said uh, the language is very much on the plane of action. So we ins inscribe our orienting anchor as that which accompanies the posited sign in its directional sense. We give it kind of an orienting context that we inscribe with it uh, when we do make that proposal at the dialogue threshold. So we, uh, we posit a sign as an extension and we posit a context, uh, context of an orientation and a trajectory for that sign within a uh, ontological structure that uh, is viewed as a living organism. And then after, only after, after having done the work of anchoring and inscribing uh, in order to uh, shape our posited sign, then we are certainly ready to enter into the realm of action. But the realm of action has a blueprint, and the blueprint is a, a schema. It has nine steps, but the nine steps will eventually lead to the reflexive embodiment of narrative. So now we understand that step. If you go back to that foundational lecture, now we understand this historical realm of a uh, how the narrative evolves. The narrative evolves out of the reflexive return in our posited sign and posited orientation. We get a return that starts to embody itself in a narrative, a narrative of universality that we can kind of park in that workspace of the posited third subject. And so we start building that uh, narrative of universality within the workspace of the posited third subject and it arrives in return after return after return out of our posited sign of extension coupled with a context of orienta orientation that has been inscribed with it. Great little lesson from Akur. He really gets us uh, much, much closer to the historical. So now we've taken, taken a look at the prep work of the perlocutionary moment that was the third moment in the previous lesson. And I'm assuming from here, we're going to be uh, jumping off into actual discussion of praxis. That'll wrap up up through page 60.